Hello everyone and welcome to this installment of the Daily Cannon Tactics Board. Stephen Bradley here to bring you a live shortening game, frankly, between Arsenal and Olympiacos in the Europa League where Arsenal managed to get a 3-1 win despite doing everything in their power to make sure they didn't. Uh, a crazy game, Arsenal, like I said, decided to both win, lose and then win the game again. It was It was crazy. But um, before I start the video and start the analysis of the game, just want to say thank you, the viewer. You know, we're we're over 300 subscribers now. We're getting, you know, a couple hundred viewers for every video. It's insane. The support has been insane. And yeah, if you've already subscribed to the channel and you're this is a you know another video in your inbox, thank you. If this is the first time you're watching a video from our channel and you do like this sort of video and you like this sort of analysis, please feel free to like the video, comment. Or even subscribe so that these videos go into your inbox immediately after they're recorded. They're usually recorded the night of the game or the afternoon of the game. So that they're there for your immediate viewing. And yeah, I mean, this game was Arsenal season in a nutshell. This was 90 minutes of everything Arsenal did well and everything Arsenal did poorly. And then everything that Arsenal didn't do at all. Yet it worked. It was bizarre. And even, even the way that... The team lined up. What you have to understand about this Arsenal side is that when you look at it on paper, when it's when the lineup is is listed at you know an hour or an hour and a half before the game, you will see it as four two one three or four two three one. You'll see it like this four two three one, and when you go on what you know on who scored, you'll see it as four two three one, and when you go on to fot mob. You'll see it as four, two, three, one. And what you have to, I suppose, realize is the fact that this is for paper, this is for show, this is just for a, a general idea of just to give the general viewer a, a snippet, a, a little bit of information on how Arsenal might line up. But the reality is that Arsenal don't defend four, two, three, one, and they don't attack in 4-2-3-1 and tonight's game was a classic illustration of both and the best way to show you how this worked is again through our good our trusty old friend the heat maps and i've zoomed in on the page I've, so that you can see them a little bit more clearly and you'll see two things one obviously arsenal have the ball a lot in right mid as we've discussed in previous videos Arsenal like having the ball here so that it gives a little bit more room for tyranny. And this was another illustration of that, which I will show in a second. But I want you to look here and here. Now, again, if your screen is not great, and mine certainly isn't, but here and here is a little bit more yellow. This is all green here. But with heat maps, you know, it goes from blue to green to yellow to red. Here and here are yellow. Now, if this bit's red, and this bit's yellow, and this bit's yellow, that would not mean that there's two here. It would mean that there's three. And that's the point. There was. Whenever, any, anytime Arsenal had the ball, they didn't line up 4-2-3-1. They lined up with Tierney all the way up here. William tucked in as like a, an inside left person. It's why he's getting picked ahead of Pepe and Martinelli right now because he's the one who has the the tactical nous and the willingness to follow instructions so that he always stays here to make room for Tierney. Pepe's not going to do that. Pepe likes being on the wing. Martinelli is chaos personified. You know, he likes to run around and, and make space for himself. Arteta wants a player in here and he wants him to stay there so that Tierney gets in there. And that's what William does. Bamiang is a Bamiang, and then Odegaard and Saka go right. That way, it gives these players a bit of space. Now, obviously, Tierney can't just you know swan off on a on, on a little jolly up here without any cover. But obviously, Willian is being instructed to be here. So, the the solution is this: Xhaka goes there. But instead of Xhaka playing left back, what Arteta does is you know he tries to create a little bit of a, of an overload. You know, to try and make sure that you've got as many players up front as you can. So Party actually goes here. Odegaard comes back and plays almost centre midfield. Saka goes in and basically plays inside right. Bellerin does a, 
a good Tierney impression. David Luiz, in, a, in essence, plays as almost a right centre back, and Gabriel stays here. And it's 3 2. Can I get all together? I can. It's 3 2 5. And the whole point of this is to do two things it's, it's to get Bellerin here and Tierney here, but still have the solidity of three at the back and two centre defensive midfielders. Yes, Odegaard is not a centre defensive midfielder, but just in case you get caught with the ball, you've still got five back. And it worked. Because... <laughs> like, what's that? <laughs> like, that, that's the left back. Yes, this was Arsenal's game plan. It was to make sure that Tierney got here. Again, look. He's on the corner of the opposition penalty box. That's the left back. And that's where he was getting the ball. That should show you how effective Arsenal were at getting the ball down this wing over and over again. And it's why, despite anyone who plays FIFA 19 will tell you that this Kenny Lala is the best right back in the world, in real life, not so much. No, he's not very good. So, Arsenal exploited that. They made sure that Tierney got in again and again. And for the first 20 minutes... He was a menace. It was beautiful cross after beautiful cross. You know, Odegaard, you know, when Will Willian would go here occasionally to try and take Socrates out of the way, so would Aubameyang. Odegaard would come in late and he misses from here. You know, and the, the, the danger signs were there. Arsenal were getting on this overlap again and again and again. And for 20 minutes, they were superb. Saka and Odegaard were, you know, running rings around their around their markers. Bellerin was doing a good good job spreading play. And, you know, Willian was doing his job. He was setting up, you know, he was getting Lada out of the way so that Tierney could get in behind. It was working. The plan was working. And when Arsenal defend, again, if we put Xhaka back there, parity here. When Arsenal defend, Tierney would obviously get back into position, but they then wouldn't defend... Four two three one. What they would do was, Aubameyang would often go wide right. Odegaard would fly forward centrally, and Saka would drop back. And it was four three three. And as a result, they were able to press Olympiakos' backline into enough mistakes, get, getting the ball to Sa, who again, is, you know, is Olympiakos getting any ball in the midfield? No. It's just it's going here and it's getting launched, usually down the down the wing trying to take advantage of Tierney getting back didn't work but that was Olympiakos' problem they couldn't get the ball out and Arsenal were able to just maintain a level of control over the game they were able to maintain a sense of not if but when when a goal was coming and the goal itself it comes from the fact that when Olympiakos were defending it was very, very old school. It was 4-4-2. Four, four, it was two banks of four. And that was it. And it was, you have to break us down. And we'll put Saka there. When you face a defence like this, what you need is players who are comfortable getting the ball here, in between the lines, as the old cliche is. And... Despite it being a common tactic, there aren't many players in the world who are comfortable in this space. I mean, take Arsenal, for example. Burkamp was brilliant at it. Says Fabregas learned everything he knew about playing as a 10 from watching Dennis Burkamp. You know, Barcelona trained him as a centre midfielder. He comes to England at 16. He goes back to Barcelona and he ends up playing almost as a striker as a false nine because he was so good in between the lines. Nasri was great at it. Ozil was great at it. Again, just find a space where he can't be marked. But there are so many attacking midfielders and you know strikers and wingers who don't like being there. You know, Pepe hates it. Pepe wants to be here or here. You know, Aubameyang doesn't like dropping back. We've seen how poor his link up play is. He wants to be on the on the on the back shoulders here and here to get in behind the lines. You know, Lacazette has learned over time to come back, but even so, it, it, his game is limited so much by running this way. Like he's much better as a striker driving forward with the ball. So you need players who are comfortable. Willian is okay, but still he's better at beating a man. But 
Smith Rowe is a player who's getting used to playing in this position a lot more and is comfortable doing this. But in Saka and Odegaard, Arsenal have two monsters in just finding space, in just being willing to make those runs that 90% of the time doesn't get them the ball, but just drags another centre midfielder away or just makes it a bit more space that a party gets it. And sometimes they get the ball. And then they can create their magic. And Saka especially, for the first 25-30 minutes, was causing so much havoc that Olympiacos had to resort to kicking him. That's all they could do to stop him. Anytime he beat his, his the, the right midfielder or he beat the centre, ma- the centre mid, kick, kicked, kicked. They just kicked him. And you can't do that to everyone because you know, the referee will look at it, oh right, you're just kicking everyone. Booking, 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 booking. So... Saka was the person they kicked. But if William's here and Tierney is an absolute menace here, then they can't all do this. Because you need to you need to make sure that you know there's someone marking Tierney. Broom is not a defender, he's a winger. So they have to cover over here a lot more. Which means Saka and Odegaard were very regularly one on one with the back line. And if everyone's kicking Saka that means this man is free. And again, after you know a minute and a half, he got in, he found space, and he should score. But then, even though Arsenal spent so much time getting crosses from this position, getting crosses from this position with Saka or with Bellerin, trying to get those easy, efficient chances in the box, which they were creating with Aubameyang, who, was, who had one really good shot blocked. Odegaard scored from here. An absolute thunder bleep of a goal. And it was what their performance deserved because Odegaard was unmarkable for half an hour. No one in the midfield wanted to pick him up and no one at the back line could. He just found space in these little gaps again and again and again. Party and Shaq were doing a great job, even if, even when they were playing a back three, of finding him again and again. They were just consistently overloading Olympiacos, either on the right or on the left, Changing their focus of attack, changing the way they attacked. And Olympiacos weren't able to respond, and Arsenal got the goal they deserved. And what happened afterwards was where most of my criticism of a Mikel Arteta coach side, and maybe most people's criticism of the manager himself, comes from. Because he is exceptional with coming up with a plan. And make no mistake, this plan was working. There's, I'm not going to have much criticism of the way Arsenal attacked because they scored three and there were three goals that they don't usually score and they could have scored a couple more. The problem is, is that it's not just Arsenal playing. You're playing against an opposition. And when Burnley got that goal, it was a result of watching Arsenal do the same thing over and over and over again. And then when Xhaka came for the ball, Burnley's front six pushed forward to make sure that Xhaka had to play this ball here. That ball into Bellerin. Well, it wasn't Bellerin, it was Chambers. But to try and force Xhaka to play a ball off his right foot into that space. So that Arsenal would have a two-on-one and away they go. And as we know, Xhaka couldn't do it because it's his right foot. When Olympiacos were pressing Arsenal, when Arsenal had the ball deep, when they had the ball with three, Party was here, Odegaard was here. All Olympiacos would do, they would press with two. And... The two centre defensive midfielders would sit deep and the back line would stay there. And as a result, Arsenal had no problem with knocking the ball around, blah, 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 get the ball to party, Tierney's, Tierney saunters up the field and off they go again. And they did it again. And they did it again. And they did it again. But any time Arsenal were coming back with the ball and any time they got pressured a little bit, they would be in a back four. Jacob would push forward, Gabriel would go back to left back, David Ruiz, 
4-2. Just to give himself a little bit, another man, another body to force in. And then when the ball would go to, to Leno, either Xhaka would come here or Partey would come here. To give them an extra man, to give Leno an easy ball and off they would go up the field again. They do it all the time. It's predictable. And the problem I have with Arteta is that he has these players coached to a T. They know that this is what they do when Leno has the ball here. Luis goes here, Gabriel goes here, and a centre midfielder goes here. He looks around, he has to see what's free, and then he passes it. Usually to a fullback. And for 45 minutes, Olympiacos didn't press it. Why? I don't know. But maybe they were expecting something else, or maybe they were too focused on making sure they stayed in the traditional Mike Bassett 4 4 2. So, 10 minutes of the second half go by. Arsenal are still trying to play the ball out the back, but they're starting to get sloppy. Even at the end of the first half, David Luiz, you know, misplaced the ball that went to that went to El Arabi, who nearly who nearly scored. No, sorry, went to Maseres, who nearly scored. Olympiacos started to realise that they knew what was coming. They knew what Arsenal were going to do. They could react, knowing full well that Arsenal were going to play the same way again and again. And when Party went off after 55 minutes and was replaced by Ceballos, suddenly Arsenal's ability to dribble out of a press evaporated. Because as we've seen with Party. When players press him like this, he can dri- he can you know faint a f- pass to here, faint a pass to here, and then dribble through because he has that burst of acceleration, and you have to respect that. You have to, as a defender, you have to at least give credence to the possibility that that might happen. So you can't just immediately pile on top of him. I don't know what happened to Spios, but over the last six months he has lost a yard of pace. It's unmistakable. Whether he's carrying an injury or not, but his ability to that that immediate burst of acceleration that he had when he arrived at Arsenal is gone, and when you're playing here, it's the most important asset you need because you need that ability to to get away from your marker immediately. If you're not you know technically superb, you need more time to do the work that you're asked to do. And when Xhaka was here, he wasn't given enough time to get it on his left foot and pass it out. He was forced to press it on his right. He screwed up. He kicks it off with the Burnley defender and it goes in. So you add that to Sabayas coming back because Leno is here now. Sabayas comes back and the Olympiacos players now know that Sabayas is going to get the ball because every time the, ball, the, the team comes back... It goes to Leno. It always goes to the centre midfielder who's tracking back. One, two, three, four. They pounce. And Ceballos is here. And now he's screwed. And he gets the ball and he immediately panics because he's like, uh-oh, I need to do something here. He miscontrols it. It bounces to her El Arabi. Leno can't get over in time. He gets in. It's an open goal. It's one off. And this is just the amount of risk that Mikel Arteta is comfortable living with. And we, as Arsenal fans, have to live with the fact that he is okay with his team getting into positions like this because he would rather that than just lumping the ball forward and losing it. And to him, the plan isn't at fault. It's the player's inability to execute the plan that's at fault. And, you know, we, we saw it against, you know, Benfica where Ceballos made a mistake and we've seen it again. Where the team puts a player like him in uncomfortable positions and he is unable to think quickly enough to get out. Now, personally, should Leno have given him the ball? Absolutely not. Of course not. He should have seen that there's four lads around him. But... If he doesn't give him the ball, Arteta will scream at him in the morning. Because he is told explicitly, when we are like this and when they push forward, your job is to get the ball to this man here. 
His job is to either pass it to the fullbacks or beat the press and then we're off and we are attacking again. It's risk and reward. And yes, it's going to cost Arsenal at times. But at what stage do you blame the players and what stage do you blame the process? Frankly, Mikel Arteta has more trust in the process than we do. Yet we might have less trust in the players than Mikel Arteta does. Because with 15 minutes to go, he still hadn't changed anything. You know, Olympiacos were back in the game. They had a great chance to make it 2-1. Arsenal were slowing considerably. You know, the, the tempo that they were playing with, in the, with the first 25-30 minutes had gone. Saka was tiring. Tierney was tiring. Willian was tiring. Odegaard was tiring. They'd already lost party. And Olympiacos, who are, you know, 16 points clear in the league, you know, who beat PSV, they are a good side. They sensed this and they started to rally. And I thought that this was going to be another video in which I slate Mikel Arteta's use of substitutions. But he kept faith. He went, no, this is the team I've picked. This is the plan I'm going with. We've got a couple of set pieces. It'll work. I convinced of it i'll trust my 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 system i'll trust my plan a and he was right you know it's a brilliant corner that goes from 2-1 william you know sets it up from here and you know you'll have to watch it online because i can't show you videos because of dmca but it's a wonderful header from gabrielle from a corner wonderful header and arsenal are 2-1 and then with 10 minutes to go with the game certainly, you know, in the, in the, in the, I won't say in the mixer, because Arsenal were 2-1 up, but he then brings on, if I could spell El Nenny, it would be fantastic. There we go. He makes three subs. And if I could capitalise Smith. He makes, he makes three subs. And is it a change in formation? Nope. Actually, he makes four subs because Lacazette comes on as well. Is it a change in formation? Nope. Is it a change in the way that the team is going to play? Nope. It is a continuation of what Arteta was trying to do. Tierney down the left. Bellerin down the right. Pepe now, you know, supposedly here, but as we saw all game, he still stays out wide. Sabayas now as a 10 instead of an 8. And then Nelly to provide legs. And then Lacazette just to hold up the ball. And... Look, I'll say it so you don't have to. If the opposition decides that Nelly wants to shoot from there... You let him. <laughs> you know, like like we can talk about game plans and all we want, but when a header from a corner is scored from, you know, 12, 13 yards out, and your other two goals are, you know, 25 and 28 yards out. Where where do you where do you draw the line on, you know, is that the system's fault or is that the player's fault? Like, are the players to blame for the goals that they conceded, but they also you know, to be applauded for the courage they're shown by taking shots and having the ability to score from there. You know, like, and then he, uh, you know, one in a, that's a one, he scored four goals in his Irish career. That's a one in a hundred goal. You know, I, I, Arsenal, 59% possession, one XG. You know, 18 shots, 17 chance created. Yeah, big chances, no. You know, like sometimes you have to say that yes, Arsenal played better, but also you have to realize that Arsenal scored three goals, and none of them would have been goals that you would expect Art Arteta to have said yes, this is where we're going to be scoring from. Yet they did, and how do you rate that? How do you determine that's a success? Like that's the infuriating thing as an analyst from this. Arsenal played pretty well. The, the the system played pretty well. Yet the reason why they conceded goals was nothing to do with the system, but everything with the fact that they didn't change it. 
and the goals had nothing to do with the system but the fact that players were able to take advantage of certain opportunities at certain times and score magnificent goals it was individual achievements and individual mistakes and is that something you credit Arteta for having faith in the players or is it something you blame Arteta for keeping making them doing the same thing you know it's it's the definition of, of insanity you know doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different answer this is clearly a good enough side that it can have you know really good goals like Odegaard's and Eleni's and Gabriel's but also bad enough to go side to concede such awful goals like the goal, the goal against Burnley and the goal tonight and that's just the arsenal we have right now it's it's Jekyll and Hyde they are a side that has mental cap- capabilities to make the silliest of errors and dig themselves the ugliest holes. Yet they also have the technical ability and the mental fortitude to put that to one side and dig themselves out of those holes and win games like they did against Benfica, like they have done against Olympiacos tonight. And it's going to be inc- incredibly difficult to judge Arteta when he's got a group of players who are so incredibly inconsistent in the same game. Never mind in over the course of the season. And can we judge him when he's got players like this who can be brilliant for 89 minutes and awful for one? Or do we have to wait another season and give him another transfer window and bring in another set of players? There's no clear answer. And right now all we can do is sit on this roller coaster and enjoy the ride. I ho- I hope you have an off license there, you dear, dear viewer, because Tottenham Tottenham Sunday and then the second leg of this on on next Thursday, I I would I would recommend uh, large bottles and one just to be in the safe side. We will talk to you next time. Good luck. <laughs>